today I'm going to be talking about the Lisa Soho building in Beijing, China. It's one of my favorite buildings, or it's probably still my favorite building. I don't think that has actually changed since I saw this building. It was finished in 2019, and the reason that it's my favorite building is because it has a really cool atrium like this. And the photo that actually got me into the building is this construction photo here because I've just never seen anything like this anywhere else in the world. This looks like something out of Star Trek or Star Wars or something. If you're new to this channel, my name is Matt, I'm in structural engineering, and I like to make videos about interesting structural engineering around the world and break it down in a way that's easy to understand. So I'm going to take my crack at this atrium here and try and break it down in a way that's more digestible because there's a lot of steel going on and looking at this the first time I was very confused and didn't know what was happening. So uh, let's get started, like let me try and go through this. So to preview the structural system is you have these two separate towers that have these really interesting oblong kind of asymmetric shapes, but they find stability by having these large belt trusses wrap around them and kind of bind them together into one structural system. I think that's really cool. The architect described it as a pas de deux, which is French for a dance for two, I think. Um, I think of it as you have these two ladies dancing and they have their arms kind of wrapping out and wrapping around each other and that's kind of how they find stability, which I think is really fun. So I'm going to start off by playing this video that breaks down the internal structural components. So you have the foundational cores extending out of the ground and you have all the vertical columns kind of coming out and twisting around creating these forms. You have both these like 3D curved columns and these totally vertical columns. Then you have the trusses which extend out from each side of the building and kind of bind them together. Then you wrap it in the facade like this, and then you have, you know, the rest of your facade. I don't know what else to say for that. Um, but yeah, so that's the basic breakdown of the structural components. Let's get into how the form of the building was derived, because that's kind of what influenced this entire structural system. So like many other buildings, the form is actually derived by the foundational constraints due to the subways, which I didn't realize this growing up, but many of the forms of our most interesting buildings out there are actually derived by subway constraints or train constraints. And this building is no different. So at the time of the construction, which started in, I believe it structurally topped out in 2017 and it was totally finished in 2019. At the time of the construction, there were two subway lines that intersected each other. There was like the 14 line and the 16 line. The 16 line actually curves around and kind of like fillets out that corner, which the building sits on. So you have each tower is built to the side of the subway so it doesn't interfere with a subway tunnel. And then you just kind of build the tower up from there. And this basic geometry, this basic tube shape was extruded out and upwards. And then you take this 16 line and that basically starts your atrium from the bottom. As you move up the building, this crevice for the subway rotates 45 degrees to the top. And this is where you get your initial twist in the structure. This also has the advantage because now you get more sunlight in at various times of the day. Uh, I don't know if this faces north, south, west or whatever, but now when you like rotate it around, you get a little bit more sun depending on where it goes. Um, I just think that's a cool detail. So you have your crevice that rotates, then from there you actually widen it in the center, which gives the atrium a little bit more volume in the middle. From there you also have the cores extend upward in each of the columns, and these kind of push out and bulge the shape so that you have room for these cores. So this is where you get some of the, like, the bulging inward and outward in plan. And then from there you also just have a few final carves that make it a lot more sculptural and pretty to look at. I don't know why the carves are there, I'm guessing they're architectural. I could not figure out why they're there, but it looks cool so I'm not going to complain. But yeah, that's kind of how the main form of the structure started and why you do have the two different structural systems that are interacting with each other. It's really interesting to me. There's tons of other examples of how building form is influenced by the constraints of the base, specifically due to trains. 150 North Riverside is a really good example. I'll make another video on that because I've talked about it before and it's really cool. And you have a lot of the new buildings in Hudson Yards or like the whole Manhattan West thing. Um, I'm working on a video for that. I just need time to edit it and I'm slow at editing sometimes because I also have a job. But you have a lot of the buildings there are just totally built on a rail yard, so you have a lot of really interesting foundations to talk about. But yeah, let's go back to the structure because this is a structural engineering video, so like, let's get into it. Um, we have the belt trusses. These are, you can think of it literally as a belt that holds the building up. Um, what you have is these two structural shapes. If the towers were totally independent, their natural inclination would be to lean to the side. And so you'd have to put a lot more concrete or steel in to like hoist it up and make sure it doesn't actually lean to the side. So you have these belt trusses that extend out and kind of connect them as one. So when one tower leans, it leans in a way that the other tower wouldn't want to lean. So it creates a sort of balancing effect. It's literally like two people dancing where, you know, if you're holding on to your partner like this and like you lean this way, you can kind of like lean on them. And it's kind of like a structural dance, I guess. I mean, that is what it happens. So that's not I guess, but... Another example is you can think of it's kind of like a barrel where you know the barrels are made of individual wood planks that are kind of curved together and then you have those like metal bands that wrap around it. This is essentially doing the same thing. If you take off the metal bands then each plank of wood kind of loses its stability and wants to like pop out. 
This is doing the same thing where the belt truss kind of binds the two large planks together and holds them into place. If you go back to this construction photo, you can see you've got the walking columns that run along the perimeter. A walking column is a column that's not totally vertical. It kind of follows the shape of the building. And so something similar happens here where you have both vertical columns that are just holding up each floor to the bottom floor below it. But then you also have these walking columns that kind of outline the geometry and create this like interesting atrium shape. Then you have the trusses here that become the sky bridges. These are at levels 13, 24, 35, and 45. And it looks like the trusses are fully concealed by the facade on the outside. So it, I'm guessing that they double as mechanical floors, which is kind of nice because you still have them expressed visually as these like solid bands around the building, but then they're not like fully expressed as trusses because you can just hide a bunch of stuff in it. Um, yeah, let's get, keep going component by component. So we have our floor slabs. These are made of metal decking with concrete, so they're composite. You have the vertical framing is composed of these walking columns with their 3D curvature. And then you also have your standard vertical columns that are slightly leaning sometimes, depending on I, I like exactly where they are in the facade. And then we have our trusses, which we already talked about. It looks like the top floor also has a truss on it, sort of as like a little crown. Um, a lot of buildings do the same thing, where even if they don't have intermediate trusses, they'll put a top outrigger on. It just kind of like binds it all together. You can think of it as like a can with like a lid. Um, then we have our beams. It looks like they're somewhat radial from the core. I'm wondering how they did this. They must have parametrically done it at each floor because you have a changing floor plan. So it's kind of interesting because you get a lot of irregular beam lengths and beam sizes. So it's kind of hard to optimize that for construction because you just have so many different pieces. It's a lot more specialized per floor, which that's not usually desired in structural engineering because you want some sort of pattern so it's easy to reproduce and not specialized per floor. But, you know, for a cool building like this, you got to do it. The facade is also interesting because it's made up of both singly curved, doubly curved, and flat panels. In this image here on the exterior, you can see how you have a lot of flat panels creating this sort of scaling effect, where it mimics a curved surface from far away, but if you get up close, like, if you go like this and like rub against it, you'd get cut. Um, it's essentially you have these like little scales there that are the flat panels. Um, this is a huge like cost savings thing, and it doesn't really affect the visual look, and it, I think it looks kind of cool. So. The atrium appears to do something similar where depending on which part of the atrium it's in, the curvature of the panel will change and be optimized. The atrium also acts as a thermal chimney. Together with the ventilation system, the building maintains a positive air pressure at the base. Thermal chimneys are something I kind of struggle to understand and explain, so I'm going to try my best to go through this. Um, I have these images here to help, which is really nice. We have one for the winter and one for the summer. You can see in the wintertime, there's not as much of a pressure differential. This is because you kind of want the heat to stay in the building. But in the summertime, when you want heat to move out of the building and cycle through, then you want this like ventilation to happen. So you would have your pressure differential. I can't explain it better than that, unfortunately. But when I can, I will come back and make a new video using this building because it is my favorite building. So subscribe for that if you're invested in my personal growth at all. If you care. I don't know. So yeah, that's all I have to say about the building. Uh, the architect is Zaha Hadid and the structural engineer is Bollinger and Groman. Uh, this is one of my favorite buildings. I highly recommend checking it out. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want more structural engineering content. And feel free to comment below any other projects you want me to talk about. I'll read through the comments and I'll try and find some interesting stuff to keep talking about. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, these are my main sources for the project. I'll put the links down in the description. So if you have more questions, feel free to check them out there. And I also have all the image credits here at the end. So thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time. Bye.